What you doing? Making furniture. Yeah? Yep. Out of live oak, which is big tree, my favorite tree. It fell over like two years ago. We got this wood cut into slab. Wait, 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 hold on a minute. From right over. Give me a zoom. Give me a zoom. Right over there. To uh, Evergreen Valley Oak, or Ever Evergreen Coastal Live Oak, uh, growing right next to a um, valley, deciduous valley oak. And the Coastal Live Oak was at least 250 years old huge and the, most of it fell over and Rhea was really sad as her favorite tree so she convinced me to uh, take the wood down and get it milled and then what did you do with it well then we had to let it dry for a year mm -hmm. but then once it dried uh, up at winters I convinced you to bring some home and then I've been making furniture with it so explain what you've got going on here this is the table you've been doing you've been working out down here well, it's actually been a workout because the wood is like 100 pounds, but... You got the weights down there? What are the weights about? Well, this isn't actually... It's not that. screwed on yet? Just trying to hold up your brackets? Yeah. So did you... Where'd you get these brackets? You mean the legs? Yeah. I got these custom made from uh, from Etsy, from a guy who like does metal smithing. Do I want to ask what that costs? <laughs> it was a lot, but it was worth it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> she doesn't want to say. <laughs> anyway, well, I like how uh, your epoxy, is this epoxy filler here? Yeah, some of the wood was so old that it was like, had wood rot, and there's a lot of like bug action into all these little things. So I just filled them with black epoxy. It was fun. I've never actually used epoxy before, but. It's, just... I like the black color. It really gives it some. Yeah. Some drama to the wood, you know, yeah. with all these these black. And it was a solution for all the, the like the spaces that needed. Right. To be so I remember out. when we got this back, there was like mold. In fact, this color here was molded, and the guy at the mill shop was like, "Yeah, sometimes these molded areas, when you sand them down and seal them, can have really beautiful coloration." And so, what a contrast it is from like the healthy wood to the molded wood, and then obviously to the void that you had that you had to fill. Yeah. Um, so this is super cool. So you're going to marry these two pieces together. And what's the idea for the, the crack? I'm going to put a planter in here. And this is going to be where I put little plants. So I think what we're going to do, she was asking me how to do this. I think we're going to mount underneath a, um, a little like suspension system for a long plastic container that will uh, have no holes in the bottom. And we'll just have to be careful about how we water it and not to overly saturate it. And we'll have a bunch of succulents growing here. And uh, you'll see just the beautiful succulents coming up. And we'll have to be very careful to make sure that the wood itself doesn't get watered and only the plants do. Um, so, uh, I can't believe I came home to this unbelievable. So Ray is a crazy artist. Maybe crazy is not the best word. Talented, is that better? Skilled. Skilled. Creative. <laughs> Creative. Uh, and she does amazing things, including uh, having the foresight and vision to build these, this furniture from our fallen tree, which is, a, so. why is this tree so special to you? The first tree I ever climbed when I was like four years old. Yeah. yeah. So you spent a lot of time in that tree. Yeah. Um, it really was an incredible tree. So, um, but it was even more special than that. Can you explain to us I, uh, wh why it was so special? It was some of the inspiration for my first graphic novel I created in college. Yeah. And basically, it's like this magic tree that my main character travels through time with. It's quite a fun concept. And that concept came to you when the first big limb cracked and fell down, right? Yeah, about, about then. That was like, you're like, it's a portal to another time. Mm -hmm. And so, so get online and go to, where do you go? Rayagrag.com? You can find it anywhere. Rayagrag or Mup, the graphic just, novel. Just type in Rayagrag Mup, the graphic novel, and you'll be able to buy that thing and read it. 
and then uh, know all about uh, what we're doing here. So, um, can you explain to me the scenery that is on this most wondrous bench you've created, Rhea? Why don't you walk, where do we start? Over there. Here is where we start. So, the tree is about 250, 300 years old. So, we don't actually know how old it is because it actually is still living. Like I think Rhea was from. airing on the extra old side at 322 years. <laughs> <laughs> but that's all right. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's good. That's off to I think it was about 250, 260, 270. But anyway, uh, you know, not to get uh, technical. But so what else do you have here, Ray? Can you show me? Yeah, I just so, drew the tree's life or what its life would have looked like. And it started with a what? Acorn. An acorn falling off of another tree. And then it landed on a barren hillside in the hills of Lafayette when there let's see, 1700, um, I would think that the missionaries were, They were here then. They, no I don't know about San Francisco. I know they were down in San Diego and Monterey, which is about 100 miles south of here. Anyway, there weren't too many. It was a pretty pristine place when uh, this all occurred. Uh, and, of course, there were quail running around, just as there are now. Um, in the morning uh, sunrise shadows of the great mountain of the devil, the devil's mountain, which is right over there. Um, and of course, Rhea shows some beautiful lupine flowers, which are growing on the hillside, uh, probably more so now than, than, than now, because there wasn't an enormous tree shading them, and they like sunlight. What else was roaming around back then, Rhea? Grizzly bears. California grizzly. Grizzly bears. When was the last grizzly extirpated out of? It's like 18 something. Yeah. So here's your grizzly bear that was wandering around in Lafayette, uh, maybe on our very hillside. Uh, what else do we have, Ray Ray? That looks like. Uh, Giant redwoods. That looks like um, Los Trompas Range right there to me. It is. Okay, that's representative of the view that we have with Mount Diablo to the east and then Las Trompas Range to the uh, south east. And, uh, and it looks like you've got some redwoods growing? Yeah, I wanted to show that there used to be giant coastal giant, redwoods. Giant coastal redwoods, right, right over. In fact, you might be able to see them. Can you see them? Maybe, let's see. Uh, from here, up in those hills right there, far off on the far ridge, right over there, just down below, that's where the native redwoods are. So Ray is being graphically correct uh, and historically accurate, except for maybe the age of the tree. Uh, but I won't tell anybody if you don't. So, okay, so you got your redwood trees. What else do we see here? Coyotes. Coyotes? Mm -hmm. What makes you think there's coyotes here? Oh, they're everywhere. <laughs> I hear them every single night. <laughs> down there waiting for our cats to make one misstep uh and so what what do we have here um the native indigenous people who used to live in this valley the Saklanis, they um not much is known about them and there wasn't much that i could find but i did find out that they the coyote was one of the most important things to their culture so that's why i included them those two coyotes and they were most certainly collecting the acorns from our very trees. Oh, for sure. To grind into their meal, um, oak, or acorn meal, which was their primary um, source of calories. And so there's the Sakalanis. Uh, my high school, Akalanis, was named after the Sakalanis. And who's this little guy? Um, that's just a kid. Just a native kid. Yeah. Back in the day. And then there's a little baby hanging from the tree. My mom's collecting acorns. Oh, is that what that is? Yeah. That's a baby hanging from the tree. That's what they used to do. That's a good idea. Um, so then uh, we have mom, um, I guess, making her her acorn meal, correct? Yeah, she's just picking them up, but yeah. And, and I guess, were they living in mud huts then, or what kind of huts were they? they? The other thing that I know about them is that they used a native reed to build their structures. Okay. I literally know three things about them, so I, that's what I included. And of course, there's birds that live here too. Yeah. What do you have there? Bald eagle. Right. 
I've actually seen a bald eagle that's returning seen, to its native habitat, I've seen flying three, over the house. I've seen three bald eagles here. Mm -hmm. but. And one of the predominant plants of the area is, of course, the California poppy, which we have lots of here. And amongst the California poppies, sometimes you'll find what, Ray? Rattlesnakes. Rattlesnakes. Yeah, right there. Uh, and of course, Rhea put her stamp on her artwork. But that's just one batch. Yeah. There's a whole second story to this. Uh, Rhea, would you like to tell the rest of it? Here? Yeah, it starts over here. Watch so out, it's, it's sticky. So it starts from right to left. Uh, the tule elk used to roam around in Lafayette, and Rhea thinks that possibly Tully Elk may have walked by the younger trees at the moment. Uh, the, the big darker tree on the left is the coast live oak, the one that fell that was the bigger of the two, from which the wood she created the benches. So there's the Tully Elk, she's going to call it 1868. Um, there's a lot going on in California. California was a state of about 18 years old then. And then uh, somewhat, some years later, Alta Crest Dairy came along, which is my great-grandfather's dairy ranch that was just at the bottom of the hill from where we live now. And uh, there's my uh, grandpa, who walked onto the ranch from Kansas, uh, escaping the Dust Bowl of the 1930s, where he got... 1907? Oh, well, that's when the dairy first started. That's when uh, Grandpa Machado, he... Uh, stowed away in a cattle boat to get to California <laughs> illegally. He's an illegal alien. That, does that make us illegal aliens? We're, we're like Probably. the offspring of an illegal alien. So Isn't everybody illegal? Yeah, I think I kind of like the idea that I might be an illegal alien. Um, yeah, and so anyway, Grandpa Greg, the, uh, my grandpa, came out here and uh, talked his way onto the ranch where he met who, Rhea? Teresa. Teresa, Grandma Teresa Gregg, or Grandma Teresa Machado at the time, uh, and Grandma Teresa and Grandpa Gregg, uh, Charles Gregg, married and kept the lineage going. And my Grandma Teresa, when we were building this very house right here in 1999, uh, shortly before she passed away, uh, she walked in with very limited mental faculties at the moment, and I'll take you in. This is a good part of the story. So this is the last time I talked to her, actually. And then she kind of went really far downhill after that and uh, sort of died not long after that. Um, but before she did, she walked through this probably door opening because we were just framing the house when she was here and I wanted to show her what I was trying to accomplish uh, with all the money that I had and much more that I had to borrow. And uh, she walked right out here to this balcony and she looked out over this hillside and she held my arm. She looked at me and she said, and pointed down here and said, I used to hunt mushrooms with my sisters down in this valley, which was really, really cool to hear because she grew up and was born in a farmhouse right down there. They owned that whole valley right there. The uh, Alta Crest Ranch uh, dairy, actually. So, uh, yeah, that is uh, my beloved Grandma Greg. And we're going to let Rhea tell, look, there's some, there's some coyote food right there. Better watch out. They're waiting out there for you. Um, but we will finish the story with Rhea. Uh, let's see what else she's got laid out for us on this bench. So Rhea, we saw Grandma uh, Teresa. Yeah. And of course, uh, what's your middle name? Teresa. Teresa. Yeah, isn't that great? So, obviously, the tree uh, grew much larger, and it became absolutely enormous. And there were limbs that went way out. And, this, uh, the, the, this piece right here, I put a little arrow, is where this piece of, piece of wood came from. Uh huh, that's cool. So, yeah, this is, first this big piece fell, 
And this is after I tried to lighten the load and everything. I should have braced it. But, in fact, I bought a brace for this very tree <laughs> um, for the second one. Still had the rest of the tree here. And I bought the brace. I had it custom made from a guy, a metal guy, that uh, welds for me. And I was gone for three days, came back with the brace, walked down the hillside to go set it up and figure out how to pour some concrete to find, to look down the hill and realize half the tree was missing. This limb had fallen and it brought a whole bunch of other limbs with it and pretty much destroyed the tree. But it's still alive. You know, the tree is still alive. We'll walk down there and I'll show you. Um, so there's big tree in the year 2000. That's, uh, you know, like a year after, uh, um, you know, Teresa came up and saw the property. So she undoubtedly would walk under this tree with her, her siblings as she collected the mushrooms that they would eat at the farm in the 800 square foot farmhouse where she and seven of her other siblings were born in and lived at. And we have a nice owl here. Uh, and then what do we have here? Oh, here's the little table and chairs that I built below the oak. And then in 2008, uh, you see a picture of the Gregg children who only really know this property as their place of uh, living. And let's see if I can name them all. That looks like Jared. Uh, I'm gonna guess that this is Rhea, and that's Muppy. And then down here is little Carson in 2008. So uh, I guess you would have been, what, nine years old then, Rhea? Yeah, that's yeah. Nine. Mupp would have been seven, and Carson would have been five, and Jared would have been, uh, I guess, 11. And is that Hugo? Yeah. There's Hugo. And Pumpkin. And, pump, and Pumpkin? I don't see, oh, and there's Pumpkin right there. Pumpkin is still around. He is still around. He is still around. And then we are adjacent to the Lafayette Reservoir, and there's the dam, and there's the tower. Of course, the reservoir is an artificial lake but it's beautiful nonetheless. And of course, um, the mountain lion, which we had on the property because of what evidence? What? What evidence did we have of a mountain lion roaming around here? Well, a bunch of neighbors saw it, but we also had a couple over the years and you'd find dead deer in the backyard. Steaming dead deer. <laughs> Uh, laid out in such a way that only a mountain lion uh, like does. Mountain lion scratches and prints. Yeah. All right, Ray, that's a pretty cool bench. Shall I uh, show them the actual tree? Yeah, do it. Yeah, let's go. Let's just take a quick little walk and give you perspective as to the significance of what Ray is accomplishing at the moment. Um, we have uh, lots of oaks, uh, both valley oaks, Quercus labata, the uh, and the evergreen live oak, coastal live oak, and that is Quercus agrifolia uh, on the property. We have bay trees, we have madrone trees, and we occasionally have black oaks, and we have big leaf maple. I believe that constitutes most of the trees that inhabit this canyon. And um, we'll just walk right down and show you the remains of big tree who's hopefully still going to be uh, kicking for a while here. Here's a naturalizing madrone. I guess it thinks that it needs to start the process all over again and that since big tree sort of met its demise. So here is the remaining healthy valley oak. Um, and uh, it's very open because there was very little light in here because the the uh, coastal live oak, otherwise known as big tree, was dominating. And uh, that's big tree there on the right, and the coastal live oak to the, or the, I'm sorry, valley oak to the left. Uh, the coastal live oak is still alive. There's two big branches. There's one right here that comes out and it goes this way and still hangs down right here. And then there's another big, enormous branch that winds its way up, and it still intermingles with the uh, valley oak. 
And a friend of mine came up here who was very adept at such things and said, Gary, this is a uh, Robles de Amor, trees that are embracing each other. Um, and this uh, signifies you and Cara, my wife. And Cara is the more conservative one <laughs> who, is, uh, who was holding me back <laughs> from being uh, extremely uh, um, overbearing, I guess you would call it. And, uh, and eventually, <laughs> because of that overbearing, uh, my tree, uh, sort of, you know, met its demise, <laughs> but I'm still here. <laughs> She's fine. <laughs> so anyway, that's the story of big tree and the furniture that Rhea made from it. And I actually carved a little, uh, platform that you, she could still climb up on and hang out on right here. And I think this tree has a lot of years left in it because it's still fairly healthy for the section that remains. And here is the beautiful uh, union of the love embrace between the two trees right there. And that's the end of the story. What were those? Two coyotes. Just two? Yeah, and a dog. Hmm. Do you know where your kittens are? She just tried to get out. She didn't close the door all the way. Oh, there's a little morsel. See, we do have coyotes.